Hello, hello everybody, and welcome to Paradise Games Monday Night Modern. My name is Alex, and I will be bringing you three rounds tonight. Looks like round number one, we've got Ian on Grixis Control versus uh, Nathan playing Blue Moon. So, uh, definitely looking forward to this first match here. Looks like we've got a nice... Uh, Watery Grave, and an Inquisition of Kozilek. But before we get into the match too quick here, I'd like to take a moment to address these Scoot Mobs you see on your screen. Uh, Scoot Mob is the newly formed uh, Paradise Games-sponsored competitive Magic the Gathering team. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about the Scoot Mob and the players on it uh, in the near future. But uh, just in case you guys were wondering what was up with that, that is the current goings-ons. Uh, with that... Uh, let's take a look at the game state here. We've got Inquisition of Kozlek revealing Opt, Force of Negation, Jace, Steam Vents, Island, and Bloodwater Entities. So Bloodwater Entities, definitely one of those <laughs> one of those readers, and Ian's going ahead and giving that one a read, as, as he should, I would say. Uh, so we'll have to see what he ends up taking. Of course, it's that Force of Negation or Opt. I would expect one of those to go away. And he does decide that the Bloodwater Entity is the one to go. Makes a lot of sense to me. We'll see an end step activation of this Scalding Tarn. And then we'll see an Opt. Looks like it'll just be Island. So down to 19 for Nathan. All right. Let's see what he manages to find off of this Opt. Can't get a great look at Ian's hand. Ian's got Blood Crypt. Looks like a Field of Rune, Force Negation, Lightning Bolt. Looks like the classics over there for Ian. I think I thought, saw a Thought Scour as well. Thought Scour, an interesting uh, inclusion in this deck because I believe Ian is playing Drown in the lock. So the Thought Scour definitely has the ability to go ahead and uh, target the blue moon player which is normally not the primary mode we see on this card normally you're targeting yourself to dredge out some type of stuff but looks like he will go ahead and target himself so no funny business here at least not yet uh, there's a steam vents and a Coligan's command the two draws there from the thought scour and the draw step here's a steam vents tap he'll send it back over let's see what we've got here on turn number three it is blood moon and force of negation going to have to be Oh, do we not have a blue card? Uh-oh. No blue card means no force of negation. Means that Ian is locked out of playing any of his spells currently. He's got a lightning bolt, but that's the only one he can play. Here's a creeping tar pit, better known as a mountain. And here comes Jace the Mind Sculptor, and I think we're done here. Yep, Ian agrees. A surprisingly fast game number one there uh, from this matchup you wouldn't expect that one to just run over real quick but alas it is uh so let's go ahead and take a look at both players sideboards here over on ian's side we have three collective brutality two kalidas trader of get one dispel one engineered explosives two plague engineer two disdainful stroke two infernal reckoning and two ceremonious rejection so obviously we're playing a control mirror here of of types so we want to uh, sideboard according to that. Disdainful Stroke seems pretty good. It counters Cryptic Command, but uh, that's probably the only target you can really expect to hit, so that one's kind of interesting. Uh, Ceremony Rejection, obviously no good. Engineer Explosives, that one, that one is a little more appealing. It deals with Young Pyromancer Tokens. It deals with Blood Moon. It deals with Thing in the Ice. Um, we've got Dispel. That one seems like great to me. And then we've got uh, three Collective Brutalities and two Kalidas. I could see an argument being made for all of these cards. I'm not certain if I'd want one, if I'd want them. It probably depends how Ian's main deck configuration is on what he, you know, has that is just going to be bad that he needs to take out. But let's go ahead and take a look at Nathan's side. Nathan has two Young Pyromancer, one Blood Moon, two Magmatic Sinkhole, one Kefnet the Mindful, one Vendelian Click, two Abraid, one Flusterstorm, two Ceremonious Rejection, one Disdainful Stroke, and two Mystical Dispute. So this one looks a little bit more suited for this controlling mirror. I like these Young Pyromancers quite a bit. Uh, the extra Blood Moon, uh, I would be surprised if he got got nearly as hard as he did in the last game by Blood Moon again, but I do think... 
that, you know, having seen how game one played out, he could make an argument for that one, but I'd probably leave it where it is. Kefnet the Mindful seems excellent, I think. It's an indestructible 5-5. Five, five. It's going to draw you some extra cards or whatever. It's a threat that matters. You know, if you can hold up Cryptic Command and if nothing happens, just go ahead and draw a card. Vendillion Click seems quite good. Flusterstorm seems excellent. Uh, and then the two Mystical Disputes also seem excellent. So, I think I'm... Uh, gonna have to favor Nathan in this post-board game here. He just has so many more sideboard cards that seem relevant to me, and granted, I'm not entirely certain of the main deck configuration of both of these players, but assuming that both of these players are sideboarding for a grindier matchup, you usually favor the player with the extra color. Uh, they usually are able to go... They're usually able to go over the top of the player without the extra color because they get uh, better cards, generally, by having that third color. But usually the black is just for, like, extra creature removal. And yeah, Ian gets some hand disruption, which is definitely very relevant. But uh, all in all, I, I think Nathan might be better prepared for a post-board game here. So we'll have to see how the games play out. Uh, I'm not expecting quite as much of a route as the first game was. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, you know, just the old turn three, blood moon, turn four, Jace, pick up your cards here game. And yeah, well, I'll be surprised if we see that one again. But looks like players are presenting here for the second game. Of course, we'll see Ian on the play this time. Hopefully he can use that to his advantage. Let's take a look at both players opening hands. All right, Ian's got good mix of lands and spells. I see Drown in the Lock, multiple, all of his colors. Uh, definitely a few too many lands, I'd say. I think he has a Cryptic Command as well. Snapcaster Mage. Eh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good hand. Ian's probably going to be forced to keep that. Looks like both players will, in fact, keep their hand. There's a Snapcaster Mage off the top for Nathan. So we'll likely see some Snapcaster Mages battling at later points. Untapped Steam Vents past the turn, so definitely a few Red Alarms probably going off in Ian's head. Uh, cards Opt, obviously, the big one, but then Mystical Dispute, another one that could be pinging to his mind if he's paying attention, and it looks like the real culprit here is Spell Snare. So here's Inquisition of Kozlek. We've got Spell Snare, Snapcaster Mage, Young Pyromancer, Thing in the Ice, and Bloodwater, Bloodwater Entity, and Cryptic Command, I believe, as the non-land spells there so that's quite the slew of problems a little short on lands there is nathan so he's he's only got the one scalding turn so if he bricks for too long here he's he might end up out of luck but we'll see what ian decides to take if he's short on creature removal he might be forced to take that young pyromancer so uh i think that we're going to see I, I would assume that we're going to see young pyromancer hit the bin here it looks like ian agrees i believe that is the most powerful card in nathan's hand it's the hardest one for ian to deal with uh you don't want to spend multiple cards on that and eh, this is a nice clean one for one with the inquisition of kozlek so we've got uh island coming out of a scalding tarn here i didn't catch nathan's draw step but we definitely need to be uh, on the lookout for him to be missing lands. Uh, the best way to lose a control mirror is by missing your land drops. So Nathan kind of on the greedy side here, keeping this two lander, presumably. Um, of course, he's on the draw and his hand was good and has, you know, quite a few early plays. So I don't disagree with the keep, but he is in danger and ooh, looks like island for turn so i'm sure nathan was very happy to see that here's the thing in the ice we got to look at looks like ian elects not to crack his fetch land at end of turn takes a draw step his draw step is collective brutality i believe so those did in fact come in meanwhile we see a nice drown in the lock take out thing in the ice uh, i'm a little surprised that we saw that now um I mean, I know that Ian's playing around counter magic of Nathan's and, you know, just need to get the threat off the board. But regardless, he is not punished. He just gets to take his draw step again. I will expect we'll see an untapped land here to be able to counter the, uh, to be able to counter, to be able to have the cryptic command up. So here is end step snapcaster mage. Just as a two one that attacks. Nathan uh, really taking the aggressive line here. I'm curious 
uh, what his plans are here. I mean, well, it seems obvious what his, what his plans are, but I'm curious if it will work. I, I think we see time and time again Nathan take these aggressive lines and these control mirrors. She's always, you know, lightning bolt you, snapcaster, lightning bolt you, you know, Mystic Sanctuary, put this lightning bolt back on my deck, and step snapcaster mage, attack you with it. And so... You know, it seems to me like Ian's probably just going to be able to flash in a Snapcaster Mage of his own at some point and be able to get slightly more value off of it. Of course, he does have to worry about the Spell Snare in hand from Nathan currently. So it looks like he's just going to go ahead and be willing to make that trade now. You know, spend your one mana. I'll spend my two. I'm not doing anything else this turn. I think I agree with this choice for me. I think that's a pretty heads up play. Your opponent's you know, already tap some mana. It doesn't look like they've got anything else big. Just go ahead and tap out of your Cryptic Command. Trade your Snapcaster Mage for their Spell Snare now. Go ahead and be able to leave your mana up for more efficient turns later. Meanwhile, I believe that's the Royal Scions Ian found. So, definitely powerful. It doesn't generate card advantage, but it definitely generates card quality. And, you know, when we talked about making sure we hit our land drops and all that, uh, I would I wouldn't be surprised to see Ian deploy that. It looks like Steam Vent's gonna enter the battlefield untapped. He'll take two from that, and here is the Royal Scions coming down. We'll see if Nathan has anything to say about that. Looks like no. He'll go ahead and loot lightning bolt off the top. I expect that we'll just see that one hit the bin. Seems worse than his other cards in hand to me. Collective Brutality, of course, can deal with the Snapcaster Mage for zero mana, you know, giving it minus two, minus two, when you also go to look at Nathan's hand. Of course, when you do that, you're investing two cards in a single spell, so, you know, that's probably, that's almost always going to ensue a a fight from Nathan, you know, getting to counter that collective brutality is really, really important, and it looks like that might be the reason Ian just goes ahead and lets it go. Let's see what Nathan finds. Jace the Mind Sculptor, cha-ching, alright, Jace is a big game, but we'll have to see if he manages to find a time to get it down safely, uh, he doesn't know this, but if he just jams it right now, uh, he, he would be able to get it under Ian and just have a resolve Jace the Mind Sculptor, of course, after that I assume we'd see Ian, you know, try to gun it down with a nice, uh, with a nice lightning bolt and a creeping tar pit, but regardless, no worries. Here comes a fetch for Mystic Sanctuary. We saw Ian holding on to that fetch for basically the entire game. He played it on like the first turn of the game or something. So we'll see uh, him go ahead, untap. I think he just put the Drown in the Lock into his hand instead of on top of his deck. If I'm correct, I think that that might have been an error there, and I believe he, I thought, I assumed he was just shortcutting for the turn, but I do believe that he drew an extra card here. So I think that he is going, that's probably going to have to be uh, resolved. Maybe we'll have to get a, a floor judge here on this. Uh, hello, new man. Thank you for tuning in. Um... Okay. Okay, well, looks like everything everything's fine here. Looks like I must have missed seeing. I saw a draw for a Royal Scions on a draw for turn, so was in fact a shortcut and then just a quick Royal Scions activation. That makes sense. All right. Attack for two. Nathan's still going just directly at Ian's face. Lightning bolt your Snapcaster Mage. Let's see if this is enough to prompt... Ian's or Nathan's response he's got he's made it clear that this is his plan so we'll see if this is something he wants to fight over it looks like he's debating just cycling a remand on the end of turn lightning bolt uh, notably Ian can't immediately cast another one but we'll have to see he could activate his field of ruin and then go find a mountain to be able to just cast it again Nathan really, really thinking about this one. Looks like he's going to decide now's the time to go crack a fetch land. Perhaps we're going to go find a mystic sanctuary to be able to draw the card. 
or draw the spell we put on top with remand, but it looks like he scrolled right past one. No, just basic island it is. I'm very curious to see how Nathan deals with this. I mean, remand your lightning bolt doesn't seem particularly effective. It's only a one mana spell. Uh, you know, Ian will probably just crack his field of ruin and do it again. Um, but looks like maybe a bigger spell here. Cryptic command counter bounce your royal scions. I believe were the modes there. But uh, regardless, counter and we'll see if Ian elects to pick up his mystic sanctuary. Indeed, he will. So, counter pickup Mystic Sanctuary are the modes there. Uh, Lightning Bolt will take out Snapcaster Mage, and then we'll go over to Ian's turn, who is now firmly pulled ahead in this game. He's now got his Cryptic Command loop online. He can go ahead and stick it right on top of his deck, plus his Royal Scions to get it, and then discard this extra land. And uh, I think Ian's probably just working towards a nice Royal Scions ultimate uh, to be able to. Deal a good bit of damage, but more firmly just pull ahead in cards. Ian does need to win the game at some point, and notably the Royal Scions Ultimate does not do that. But uh, from the position he's in, it seems like he is advantaged despite having fewer cards in hand than Nathan. Nathan, I believe, pinched on mana. I touched on the mana being a problem earlier on in this match, and this is something that can happen when you keep a two-land hand. Sometimes, you know, he, he hit his third and fourth lands on time, but he just hasn't found one since, and now we see Ian pulling away in the ability to cast multiple spells each turn, and that's a really big deal, so. End of the turn here, we're seeing Ian activate Field of Ruin. Field of Ruin targeting that Steam Vents. Field of Ruin, actually a pretty important card in this uh, matchup nowadays, because... Uh, it actually takes out Mystic Sanctuary, which uh, is a way to interact with these Cryptic Command loops without actually uh, without actually needing to put a spell on the stack. So here we see, in response, Archmage's Charm. So he'll go ahead and draw two cards. He did it in response so that Ian could not cast Cryptic Command. So pretty well timed there. Uh, you know, for a second you want to say... You know, just wait until it resolves so you can have your own remand up. But, of course, then Ian has his cryptics, so that's no good. Of course, Nathan not going to be able to play any lands he drew off that still, because I assume this was in the end step. All right. So let's go over to Ian's turn. We'll see him take a draw. Land plus... The Royal Scion's Cryptic Command off the top. Ian still electing to just leave his mana where it is. Not willing to discard either of his powerful, any of his powerful spells, excuse me, uh, to be able to progress his mana. But, of course, Nathan now catching up. Ian only has six lands, so it's not like we can see a huge flurry of spells here from Ian. He does have Cryptic plus Drown in the lockup, but Nathan knows about both of these spells, so we'll have to see if he wants to do anything. Initial reaction is no. Here comes the Royal Scion's ultimate. He'll draw four cards and do, oh, I believe that's eight damage to Nathan. Just chunk him down to, two, down to eight. Eight it is. So... Now I assume we'll see we'll see Ian start to make some land drops. Uh, at least I would hope so. Ian's gonna be pretty sad if he doesn't get to play a land here, but he might actually have missed on lands. Looks like collective brutality. I expect this is duress you as the mode. Look at target opponent's hand, taking an instant sorcery. Looks like we are escalating it, so this must be drain and look at your hand. So, that leads me to believe that Ian's trying to look for some way to close out the game. Perhaps he drew some relevant threats. He also discarded a land, so I'm sure he has another one that he can play for his turn. Uh, but I'm mildly surprised that he didn't play his land before doing this. He could need the extra mana. Um, you know, the fact that he didn't do that and discarded a land really just telegraphs to Nathan that, no, I only have the one piece of interaction or, you know, two if I can play double drown in the lock or whatever. But you're basically just telling your opponent that you don't have, like, a random spell snare as well or a spell pierce even. And 
that's pretty relevant information for Nathan to have, I think. So, I think a small misstep, but in the end, probably not going to cost him too bad. Here is Drown in the Lock, your Snapcaster Mage. Ian does not want to tap out for the Cryptic Command, wants to play around Spell Pierce as much as possible. Of course, has played into Spell Snare, so we'll see if that ends up mattering. Uh, Remand here, plenty good to take out the Drown in the Lock with only a Mystic Sanctuary and a Steam Vents back, and this is why I think Ian should have played his land before he did this. He could, would have been able to go find a swamp or a black source of some kind here with this on the stack, and then Remand wouldn't have been able to just, you know, hard counter the whole stack like it's about to. Of course, the Snapcaster Mage will be able to just find the Spell Snare in Nathan's graveyard, and that's going to be a very clean exchange here for Nathan. He's going to be a clean two-for-one. Snapcaster takes out the Spell Snare. Um... Remand, you're drowning the lock. I draw a card. Mystic Sanctuary, put Archmage's Charm back on top. Snapcaster's going to spell snare your collective brutality that you had to discard a card for. So, Nathan really getting the best out of this exchange. Not only did Ian discard a card for his spell, uh, Nathan also got to counter it for a single mana. Plus, he got a 2 1 out of the deal. So, that's, that's really feels like kind of like a 3 for 1 here for Nathan. And uh, I think it might have been able to be prevented if Ian had just played his land before he tried to do that. So uh, I think a small misstep here could cause Ian to lose a lot of the footing he had. And notably, now his Royal Scions is under duress as well. Because if because Nathan just has a 2-1, he can just untap and attack it with. Of course, Nathan is at 7. And, you know, Ian looking to try and finish out the game, notably, by... Uh, Sending more and more damage at Nathan, so that's something we'll have to be aware of. Here is Snapcaster Mage, Lightning Bolt. I expect Lightning Bolt to go at uh, Nathan's Snapcaster Mage. There's a Force of Negation in Nathan's hand. I wonder if he's really thinking about that. For that play to be reasonable, he'd have to have a way to get this Snapcaster Mage out of the way as well. It looks like he is going to force it. Exiling, exiling, excuse me, Bloodwater Entity. So we'll, let's see what uh, what Nathan's plan here is. He must want to get this Royal Scions off the battlefield. I agree, it matters quite a bit. Um, but I expect him to have a way to deal with the Snapcaster Mage. I mean, if we're just attacking and trading Snapcaster Mages here, like, that doesn't seem like a really great plan to just randomly force this Lightning Bolt. So, looks like the attack has been declared, and Ian's just debating... Whether or not he actually wants a Snapcaster Major, the Planeswalker, and yeah, he just wants the just wants the uh, just wants the Snapcaster Mage. It's pretty surprising. Uh, Nathan's at seven, which is not super low. I would expect this type of play if Nathan were at like four or less, but that's still four attacks with Snapcaster Mage. That is a lot of Snapcaster Mage attacks. So somewhat surprising here. What about the spell ground play mat? I don't really know anything about the spell ground play mat. I must admit, I've never played it, so uh, I know uh, I know that he's a fan of that spell ground play mat. He uses it a lot, but I don't. I, I have to be honest. I don't really know much about it. All right, an ancient relic of magic past. Oh boy, it, it must be ancient. A modern relic of Yu-Gi-Oh history. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know anything about it. So I'm, I'm must be sorely misinformed. I'll have to ask him about it uh, after the match. But maybe, maybe I can get a nice history lesson. Meanwhile, Ian doing a little bit of digging, and then he's just gonna go ahead and animate his creeping tar pit. This a pretty relevant clock, and you know this is. Uh, presumably, th this is an interesting decision from Ian, whether he's supposed to attack Jace or Nathan directly. Five damage would put Nathan to dead to another creeping tar pit, and of course, Nathan fetching down to six means that if this is at Nathan, it'd put him to one. Hopefully, I'll get confirmation from uh, the floor whether or not this attack is going at Nathan or at Jace, because that's a pretty interesting decision. Probably changes Nathan's plays quite a bit. 
Uh, I'm getting confirmation it's going directly at Nathan. So we are ignoring the Jace Mind Sculptor, which is uh, a bold decision at any point <laughs> to ignore your ignore your opponent's Jace the Mind Sculptor. Uh, Snapcaster Mage will target Cryptic Command, or no, 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 Mystic Sanctuary targeted Cryptic Command. Here's a Snapcaster Mage. Snapcaster Mage will block. Snapcaster Mage targeting anything. It doesn't matter. Nathan down to three, so still very dead on board to uh, Ian untapping and being able to attack with his Creeping Tar Pit. Ian notably missing the mana to be able to protect his Creeping Tar Pit super efficiently. He does have a Cryptic Command that he, if he had all of his mana for, would be able to do. Um, but now he's just going to go ahead and deploy a young Pyromancer of his own and then send the turn on back to Nathan. So now Nathan's life total very immediately under pressure. <laughs> cryptic Command off the top, though. That might be able to buy him some time. Ian will untap with Tar Pit Activation plus Cryptic Command backup. So I believe that Nathan's going to need to do some digging with his Jace to be able to get out of this, but yeah, it's pretty tempting to just go ahead and get that young Pyromancer out of here. Uh, that one's pretty rough. Ooh, Drown in the Locks, the draw. Alright, here's the activation of Creeping Tar Pit. We're going to see him go to combat. Nathan, of course, going to cast Cryptic Command. This should be Bounce Your... No, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the modes are because Ian shows him the counter spell, and that is enough for game number two to go back over to Ian's side. So now we'll see a uh, nice tied up match. That game two looking a little bit more like I expect the match to. Uh, we saw a blazing fast game one, but yeah, it's pretty rough. <laughs> Dead to creeping tar pit AMA. Uh, yes, I would like to ask you. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have many a questions. How did you end up dead to Creeping Tar Pit? Uh, did you forget he had Creeping Tar Pit? <laughs> uh, Modern is not quite as popular as Pioneer in this store. Um, Modern... Pioneer tends to have about 20 players, and Modern usually hovers around 10 to 12. Uh, Pioneer is the, the super new hotness, but we will be starting up weekly Pioneer here on Thursdays. So if you're looking to come out and play some Pioneer... Thursday is going to be the day moving forward in December. Obviously, we're not going to be having Pioneer on Thanksgiving, but, uh, you know, we will we will be in the near future. So I believe we're also going to be streaming Pioneer on Thursdays. So uh, looking forward to that. I wouldn't say Modern's dead. I wouldn't say Modern's dead, but uh, it definitely took a hit from Pioneer, but so did, so did Standard. You want to talk about a dead format? Let's, let's talk about Standard. <laughs> All right. Big fan of Moose Munch. I can't say I know what Moose Munch is, Nubtub. You're going to have to inform me on that. I feel, I feel like everybody's making a fool of me. Pan once upon a time, you cowards. <laughs> once upon a time did nothing wrong. Come on, guys. Once upon a time is just out there living its life. It's a zero mana cantrip. It's fine. Oh, you're writing a once upon a time book? You can go up there with uh, Stephen Menendian and his gush book. It can be on the, on the store side by side. On the shelves. That sounds excellent. I would read the Once Upon a Time book, to be honest. A Moose Munch book. Well, that sounds... A Moose Munch book sounds less interesting than a Once Upon a Time book, to be honest. I think you should write the Once Upon a Time book instead of the Moose Munch book. You it, At least chapter one better be what is Moose Munch, because I don't know what Moose Munch is. I assume it's a snack of some kind, but it sounds like it's for mooses. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less off that. And before you flame me about the plural of moose, I do know that it is not mooses. <laughs> All right. Take a look at game number three and its play design decisions for 2019. I'm going to avoid I'm going to avoid taking this stream in the we're going to flame Wizards of the Coast direction, at least for a little bit here. We're playing modern. We don't have to worry about heinous design decisions until we see Oko on camera. So take a look at game number three here. Got about 20 minutes left in the round. Should be plenty of time for these players to finish up, hopefully. Looks like Nathan's going to keep his 7 in on a Molda 6 real quick. It's uh, pretty normal. I believe this is the first mulligan we've seen the whole match. So, feeling pretty good. A Molda 6 on the draw, not the end of the world. Especially with the London mulligan, makes it a little more, a little more palatable. So, Ian hopefully shouldn't feel too far behind just yet. 
Of course, we want to avoid seeing any mold of fives, but this hand looks keepable to me. Three lands. Looks like Thought Scour. I think I saw a young Pyromancer in there as well, mayhaps. So. We'll see how this ends up playing out. Here's Scalding Tarn from Nathan on the first turn of the game. Dreadbore off the top for Ian. Of course, that one has a little bit more text in these control mirrors, being able to deal with Jace, but I think Jace is the only real Planeswalker in Nathan's deck. Uh, you know, a lot of the times these controlling decks have many Planeswalkers nowadays between Narset, Teferi, and all that. But uh, I think it's just Jace for Nathan. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this Dreadboard just pointed at Thing in the Ice at some point in time. Uh, Scalding Tarn's going to go find a Steam Vents, enter the battlefield tapped. It seems uh, pretty, pretty standard here. Scalding Tarn on Ian's side as well. Ian's going to go ahead and see the flop. Alright. Looks like we got a Snapcaster Mage. I didn't get a good look at anything else there from Nathan. Oh, speaking of Jace the Mind Sculptor, there it is. Alright. Here's an end of turn Thought Scour from Ian. Just fetching out Island. Looks like he's going to take a second guess on that, but yep, yeah, Island it is. With Thought Scour targeting Nathan. <laughs> Cha-ching! There's the Drown in the Lock payoff. I mentioned it earlier. So, we can expect this Drown in the Lock to be online now. Of course, it does help Nathan's Snapcaster Mages out, so that's definitely a relevant problem, and Nathan does have the Snapcaster Mage, so, you know, Cryptic Command pretty relevant card to just to have in Nathan's graveyard that Ian's going to have to remember for the future that Nathan does have access to Snap Cryptic uh, as soon as he hits his re requisite lands of course so another land go from Nathan looks like a lot of land go early on in this game pretty standard players deploying their cantrips at opportune time finding their mana making sure they get to cast their spells oh boy is the chat going off on Oko what have I done? I tried to avoid it. I'm sorry, chat. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I appreciate the uh, appreciate the activity. That's pretty nice. All right. Looks like a swamp. No. Well, looks like we might see something. Snapcaster. The dry Snapcaster Mage. Once again, we saw Nathan do it in the last match. Here comes Ian with the dry Snapcaster Mage. Apparently, this is just the strategy now when you're on the draw in the control mirror. You're just supposed to ambush Viper this thing. I don't know. I Maybe I missed, like, something at some point. But, like, I can't remember the last time a Snapcaster Mage just got there. You know? Like, they, they just never get there. <laughs> and here we see that uh, Thought Scour already coming back to bite Ian. Uh, he's casting Snapcaster Mage. He's going to go ahead and target Opt. He's going to be able to cast the opt. Notably, this opt got milled by that Thought Scour. Ian could have drowned in the lock the Snapcaster Mage. I don't know. If we're casting it as an Ambush Viper, our opponent's going to get to opt out of it. I'm kind of into just snapping off Drown in the Lock, but it's rough tapping out, uh, you know, at the end of your opponent's turn three before they untap and have Jace Mana is always a risky proposition, so I can't say I hate not having options here, so... Looks like, uh, oh, that was a, Ian still thinking about the Snapcaster Mage. Oh, boy. All right. Quite a bit going on here. So, uh, Ian elected that Snapcaster Mage is fine. In response to you targeting, he was going to flash in his own Snapcaster Mage and target his Thing, uh, target his Thought Scour. That then got Mystical Disputed, which means that Nathan's out of an opt, but uh, still got to resolve his Snapcaster Mage, and now has four mana going into his turn, and we got Ian to tap two of his lands. So, uh, Ian, by sequencing this way, did effectively deny Nathan a card, so that's pretty good, but uh, all things considered, I still think Nathan ended up ahead a little bit here. I'm curious to see if he's just going to jam this Jace. It's turn four. Your opponent only has one mana. There aren't too many spells that counter that, that punish you here. 
But if he has one of them, you're gonna, you're gonna, you might be in trouble if your opponent untaps and jams something big themselves. So, pretty rough. We also saw Mystic Sanctuary put a spell back on top of Nathan's deck, but I didn't quite catch that one. So, if anybody in chat wants to let me know what card went back on top, it would be appreciated. Oko, slightly more broken than Oxwand. All right, that's a pretty hot take. Slightly more broken than Oxwand. That one burns to touch. <laughs> okay. Field of Ruin from Ian. I wonder what we've got to do with that. Field of Ruin, probably just going to hang out for the better part of the, the game. Potentially blow up a Mystic Sanctuary in response to a, uh, to a Cryptic Command loop. Looks like here is two mana, Exile My Graveyard, Tassiger. Oxwand was utterly snapped in half. The most broken card in the format, Oxwand. Oxwand's insane. Here's Tasker. Um, Magmatic Sinkhole, your Tasker. So, quick reset on our graveyard count here. As both players end up delving it away for a spell and then ending up with just a Magmatic Sinkhole versus a Tassiger. Obviously not super good for Ian's Drown in the Locks that he's got in his hand. Bloodwater Entity gonna slap that Magmatic Sinkhole right back on top. Uh, that's somewhat surprising that he would elect that this is now this is now the time to do this and you know he's missing his land drops and i kind of just want to draw lands if i'm nathan i really want to find a time to deploy my jace i want interaction to protect my jace the lands to do it so i don't necessarily agree with this game plan here from nathan i would be doing things like you know put my magmatic sinkhole back on top of my deck you know when i feel like all right i've got this thing you know i've got the things i need here i don't have you know, answer to opposing Planeswalker or, like, a Kalidus or whatever. Like, I'll just make sure I have this Magmatic Sinkhole in case things go poorly. But I don't think Nathan really is in that position yet. That's the type of play I would expect to see after, you know, two or three turns of an active Jace type deal. Lightning Bolt targeting Bloodwater Entity. Uh, I, I assume this is targeting Bloodwater Entity. It's 2-2 Flyer with Prowess. Thing beats pretty hard. Ian's a 13, so relevant clock. Of course, that puts one more card in Nathan's graveyard for his Drown in the Lock, but it's still only a single card. So, Drown in the Lock currently pretty much offline. Also worth noting that, uh, you know, with this instant speed magmatic sinkhole that, e or that Nathan has access to, the Drown in the Lock gets pretty awkward as a counterspell going into future turns, so... Here we go. Here's turn four, Jace the Mind Sculptor, and let's see what happens here. It just resolves. So, brainstorm away. Another Jace. Didn't catch the other two. I think Cryptic Command, maybe a Blood Moon, or some other ones. We'll have to see what he decides. Looks like Jace went back on top, and I think he's got to put one more back on top, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, nope, looks, looks like no. Yeah, looks like he already put back the requisite two. I only saw the Jace go back, but I'm sure Nathan, uh, is not cheating. Notes how Brainstorm works. He's been playing with Jace for plenty long. I would, I would hope he knows how it works. So, looks like Ian debating giving Nathan a free shuffle here. But, you know, he gets to spend his mana, turn this Field of Ruin into a colored source. I assume that's going after Mystic Sanctuary. And, uh, looks like it must have resolved, but I don't see Nathan doing anything yet. Oh, it went after Steam Fence. Interesting choice. Uh, I'd expect Nathan to just go find a mountain here, but I, I do think I would have preferred to go after the Mystic Sanctuary there. It's definitely the more problematic land in the future. Is Nathan thinking about just leaving himself with no red here to find a fourth blue? He does. Interesting. So, uh, this puts him in a somewhat awkward position here by going after the Steam Vents, where if we go and find Mountain here, he isn't going to be able to cast any of the counter spells in his hand, but 
I don't know. I mean, I think we decided that that was where we were at when we just decided to slam our Jace. You know, I guess that hopefully we were trying to find a land in our top three, but I don't think you could realistically hope your Jace was going to resolve. Like, I think when you're slamming your Jace, you're assuming that you're not casting counterspells on the next turn and that you know your opponent doesn't have anything too much. But I, uh, we'll see how it plays out. Here's Dreadbore. And I expect we're just going to see that go after Jace. I do like the attack, though. Attack Jace with Snapcaster Mage. First things first, you're almost certainly prompting a trade here from Nathan, which does make your Drown in the Lock better. I'd be surprised if Nathan lets Jace just take two. Oh, it looks like he actually went after Nathan's face. I don't... I don't hate this. Obviously, you know you're trying to dreadboard Jace, so the two points of damage super not super doesn't matter. But I think your opponent's pretty likely to trade Snapcaster Mages in that situation, which I do think is quite advantageous for you given your Drown in the Locks that are kind of rotting in your hand. But regardless, here's a take two from a Watery Grave. It's going to put Ian down to nine, Snapcaster Mage down to seven. Pretty low. Definitely an important note but looks like no land again from nathan stuck on four mana again field of ruin that's another one that is going to be able to put a card in nathan's graveyard if he needs to ian stops the race slows it down a little bit there's an land from nathan the fifth island no red mana anywhere to be seen so ian course can't be too scared of lightning bolt when his opponent doesn't have red mana and also you know ian knows he's got a magmatic sinkhole in his hand that he can't cast so the lack of red definitely hurting nathan currently here's an attack here's a easy snap block from ian i tend to agree i don't think that ian should activate this field of ruin here it gives your opponent red mana that seems pretty bad if we don't have to do that the royal scions the draw now i don't think we want to tap our, so we, our opponent has four cards in their graveyard. Yeah, that that's probably good enough. We could notably leave up our Field of the Ruin in case our opponent tries to, you know, cast a five CMC spell that we'd want to counter with our Drown in the Lock because we'd be able to do that. But, you know, it looks like here's Cryptic Command. Four cards in Nathan's graveyard means the Drown in the Lock going to be able to counter it. Let's see if Nathan has more interaction for a single mana. There's Mystical Dispute. So that will finish things off. Cryptic Command counters a spell, draws a card, untap, and draw from Nathan. So the fifth land ended up being pretty important. We did see him represent that Mystical Dispute pretty hard earlier, so Ian probably knew he was playing right into that one. Draw Go, I believe, was from Ian. Didn't quite catch what the card was, kept it pretty close to his, pretty close to his chest. Looks like another Drown in the Lock. It's going to have to go after the Snapcaster Mage. Uh, absolutely true. Snapcaster Mage, way too, far too threatening for your life total here at this point. Not to mention that it gets some extra value upon entering. So, absolutely going to have to take this one out. Notably, Nathan also drew a Lightning Bolt. So, two Snapcaster Mages at Mage attacks, plus finding a Red Source would be able to do Ian in. Feels like Nathan's pretty far ahead right now. Of course, Ian out of cards completely. He does still have the mana advantage, but it doesn't matter too much when you have no cards. Nathan managed to uh, pick his spot better in these games, it appears. And here's Thing in the Ice. That is a one-hit kill at this point. Ian's life total, a measly seven. Here is Thought Scour. I would expect it to go after Ian. Fatal Push, Polluted Delta in the bin. Another fresh one off the top. Fatal Push, targeting your thing in the ice. That checks out. Nathan, nothing to do about that, so that one's going to have to resolve. Here's Opt. I expect that one to just get fired off main phase. It will. Pretty happy to find a land if I'm Nathan, looking for a red source in particular. Be an interesting position if you found Island there, but there's the Steam Vents, so, or excuse me, the Scalding Tarn. So now red spells are online. So now Ian's got to be pretty scared about all of these lightning bolts. Here's Inquisition of Kozlek. I wonder if Nathan's going to respond with a bolt to the face here. Uh, it seems pretty reasonable to do so, but looks like he won't. Hand is lightning bolt. I'm not certain the... I'm not... It's lightning bolt magmatic sinkhole, and I'm not certain the two in the middle there. Uh, that's an invocation for sure. Oh, it's cryptic command. 
that looks like a true name nemesis to me, but it's definitely not that. It's, it's uh, oh, it's Remand and Spell Pierce. Got it. Okay, so not a cryptic command. It is a spell pierce. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you to Twitch chat for helping me out there. Uh, for some reason, I saw that, like, corner of that art, and my mind was just like, it looks like true name nemesis, man. Obvi I, obviously, it can't be that, so that's why I was perplexed for a moment, but for some reason, I... Uh, my mind did not immediately go to remand. Force of negation, the draw. So now we see <laughs> Ian looking looking at his opponent who has, you know, basically everything he could want. Of course, he did take the lightning bolt, worried about his own life total, which, you know, he can't feel too happy about. He's at seven. I don't know. I might have been inclined to just leave my opponent with the lightning bolt, but... Here we see Gurmag Angler getting jammed into a remand. Normally, a pretty poor encounter for the Gurmag Angler, but Ian has plenty of mana and plenty of cards to be able to do this with. So he's going to go ahead and spend two mana. Means he'll be exiling four cards. Or, excuse me, five cards. So, oh, let's spend an extra mana. There's the total seven. So here is seven mana for Gurmag Angler. Uh, we'll see how Nathan wants to deal with this. Looks like he'll just let it resolve and then take the opportunity to Magmatic Sinkhole away some of the cards in his graveyard. Of course, he knows that exiling the full five to the Magmatic Sinkhole is definitely an advantage here because it turns down Ian's uh, Drown in the Locks. Of course, he does still have, it looks like, six or seven cards in his graveyard. So... Ooh. Not an immediately, not an immediate payoff, that's for sure, but it is going to matter at some point. So, who was that Thunderous Wrath? Off the top, Miracle It for one, put you to two. I guess Ian's glad that he got rid of that Lightning Bolt. Jeez, what is this Thunderous Wrath doing here? Hello. So now Ian knows that he's dead to a Mystic Sanctuary, which, you know, that Scalding Tarn definitely is representing. So the Mystic Sanctuaries plus Thunderous Wrath, that's a pretty cute interaction, especially with the Bloodwater Entities floating around in Nathan's deck. There is the Mystic Sanctuary. It's going to be able to put Thunderous Wrath right back on top. Plus, plenty of interaction in Nathan's hand means that I expect that Ian's not going to be able to live through this next turn. I think the Thunderous Wrath... Probably just going to be able to do him in. Of course, we'll have to see. Here's Thunderous Wrath targeting you. Let's take a look at Ian's hand. It better be good. Cryptic Command. Expect this to be counter draw. Remand. And that will do it. Means we'll see Nathan take him out. Yeah, I believe that Ian did have an opportunity to Field of Ruin. Er, excuse me, that Ian had an opportunity to use his Field of Ruin there to take out. Uh, to force Nathan to shuffle his deck, but uh, I think he must have missed it, which meant that Nathan does find the victory. But uh, that's a, that was a pretty fun match. I definitely enjoyed that one. Uh, I'm always down for a good old-fashioned control mirror to uh, start, start off the night. I uh, love seeing some cryptic commands fling back and forth. Um, with that... I would like to take a moment to thank the first sponsor for tonight's stream. I would like to thank Tabletop. Tabletop is the best in board game apparel brands. We've got the holidays coming up. Uh, anybody who enjoys board games uh, in your family or you in particular, uh, Tabletop is the best in the business. Their clothes are super comfortable, super soft. Uh, they're super high quality, and everybody likes you know showing off the stuff they enjoy on their clothes. So I highly recommend if you guys are into any type of board game type deal. Uh, go ahead and check out Tabletop. Um, we're going to leave you with some hot damn scandal real quick. Uh, we'll be right back. That was the last match. So uh, I will be right back with our second round for the night. So make sure you don't go anywhere. I'll see you guys in just a minute or two.
The bottom fell out of the clouds today And the rain came down like a mirror One big sheet and it shattered on the ground Now it's seven years of bad luck all over this town mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's collection time on all of your debts And you can't get by just talking Your smile don't work and your car don't start And your doors ain't keeping you alone No, not even if you like them No, not even if you like them When you're tapped into that bit of pain, just about anything feels good. Alrighty everyone, welcome back to round number two here of the Paradise Games Monday Night Modern Tournament. We have Abraham versus Dylan, a little bit of Grixis Death Shadow versus, I believe Dylan is playing Teamer Freed from the Real Combo. So, uh, let's, this, this deck's kind of a weird one, so we're gonna have to see if Abraham really knows what he's doing with this one. There. Uh, there are quite a few potent combos in the deck, but the deck looks like quite a pile at a glance, and boy does this hand illustrate that. We see Merchant of the Veil, Fate Stitcher, Devil's Play, even, in the hand for Dylan, so we'll see what, uh, Abraham elects to take. Looks like he's just gonna go ahead and take a Fertile Ground. Uh, Fertile Ground, definitely one of the more important pieces, you know, with a Fate Stitcher freed from the real... And a fertile ground, of course, you can generate infinite mana, and that is usually what the deck tries to do. Um, it's a combo deck, it tries to generate uh, infinite mana, and then it tries to and then it tries to win the game in a variety of ways. There's walking ballista, we see that devil's play in hand, that can do it. Alternatively, if it doesn't have the full combo, uh, Nissa who shakes the world is also in the deck, and that's a particularly troublesome card for a lot of decks. Death Shadow probably would struggle with it in amount, although it often has creatures larger than 3-3, three, three, so we'll have to see how this plays out. Notably, Abraham already down to 17. Let's see. Oh, boy. I didn't get a great look at that hand, but it looks like a lot of thought scours to me at a glance, so we'll see how this ends up playing out. Pretty slow hand if that's the case from Abraham. He will start with thought scouring himself, putting Drown in the Lock and Bloodstain Mire into the bin. Drawing himself a Swamp. Here's another Watery Grave. Uh, GDS not a good matchup. Yikes. That's no good. Uh, Abyssal Mole Br or Brad McCarter in the chat. Definitely the expert on this deck. So I'm going to take his word for this one. GDS does not sound like a good matchup. They have a pretty fast clock. Some cheap and relevant interaction between Stubborn Denial and uh, Thoughtseize Inquisition. So pretty... Makes quite a bit of sense. I would not peg GDS as a good matchup for Teamer freed from the real combo, but we'll uh, we'll have to see if Dylan can find a way to maneuver through it. So a couple thought scours from Abraham. There, he's got Snapcaster Mage, and uh, we'll see what else he wants to get done. Looks like. This is Snapcaster Mage Inquisition of Kozlek during his main phase. Decides there's some threats that he needs to deal with here in Dylan's hand. He's going to... Dylan's going to respond to this Inquisition of Kozlek. Fetch and a shock down to 14, I believe. So, or down to 15, excuse me. So we'll have to see uh, how he manages to deal with this it looks like is it charm will be the response uh <laughs> yeah that's that's pretty good is it charm will just counter the inquisition of kozilek nothing too spooky there uh he's still got that merchant of the veil hanging out in the adventure zone over there waiting to be brought back of course it's not the best card on its own it's just a 2-2 with a three mana activated ability but uh i do think that we'll see that come into play at some point. This is a pretty, uh, pretty grindy matchup. All right, we've got Wooded Foothills from 
Dylan. And it looks like just send the turn back over to Abraham. Now, notably, he did not cast the Merchant of the Veil that he has in his Adventure Zone, so presumably he's got something else to do with his mana. He just shipped it back. This is a whole lot of nothing that Dylan's doing currently, which sometimes happens when uh, these G GDS decks disrupt these combo decks, but... Uh, Dylan is going to need to find something to do here at some point, otherwise he's just going to die to a Snapcaster Mage. So, we'll see how that plays out. Dylan down to 13 now. He's the main phase 2 Serum Visions. Looks like we'll see one to the top, one to the bottom. Abraham drew his, uh, his copy of Island as well. And you're not super happy to keep drawing these basics when you're Abraham. You don't really want to be doing this. This isn't the matchup where you want your basics. You just want to draw your fetch. You just want to draw your shocks and your fetches so that you can ping yourself down to, you know, that life total where Death Shadow starts becoming relevant. Um, so we'll see if he manages to ever get the uh, namesake card of the deck and play this game. But as of now, he's just struggling to keep himself get himself down to a low enough life total where that matters and you know dylan's deck is not super good at pressuring your life total so i definitely think that abraham if given the option would absolutely start pinging himself to down to a low enough life total to have the option to play these death shadows regardless of if they're in his hand so it's unfortunate that he doesn't have that ability Meanwhile, on Dylan's side, there's the Nissa who shakes the world off the top that I mentioned earlier. Definitely one of the better cards for him to find. If he manages to find another land, he's going to be able to uh, just kind of jam that and hope it sticks, <laughs> probably is where he's at. Um, it's pretty unlikely to stick, given that we know Abraham has the interaction to make it not stick, but, you know, maybe, maybe Abraham will just tap out this turn, but we'll see. All right, here's another Thought Scour targeting himself. Uh, must have been the draw for turn, otherwise I assume we would have seen Abraham fire it off at end step there. Not too much you can be scared of at instant speed, especially with one mana from the teamer freed from the real deck. All right, let's see if Abraham's willing to trade his Snapcaster Mage for a Merchant of the Veil, and more importantly, if Dylan's willing to make that trade as well. Here is the Polluted Delta, so Polluted Delta will be able to get Abraham down to 12 life. Also find himself red mana, which until now he's been missing, so that's pretty important. Blood Crypt is the find. So Death Shadow now online. Of course, it's only a 1-1, one -one, so it can't even attack by this measly Merchant of the Veil, but, you know, maybe Dylan will make a trade. It looks like Abraham's just going to go ahead and demand that it get off the field with a Fatal Push. Uh, pretty impressive to find a, a use for the Fatal Push here, actually, uh, because they, they're they pretty dead in this matchup. But here come the last two cards in Abraham's hand, both Death Shadows. Let's see how this goes now. Starting with Utopia Sprawl. Oh, Merchant is a 2-3. My bad, my bad. I, for some reason, I always assume that card is a 2-2. Two, two. You're absolutely correct. So, here is Utopia Sprawl. Looks like naming Blue, Unearth, Fate Stitcher, and then go ahead and make Infinite Mana, and then Devil's Play for Lethal. Yep, easy enough. There we go. So, Dylan managed to find the card he needed. He found that Utopia Sprawl allowed him to make Infinite Mana, and then Devil's Play down Abraham to take the first game so not a good matchup but Dylan pulls into the lead up a game let's take a look at the sideboards here Abraham on Grixis Death Shadow he's got three Force of Negations one Snapcaster Mage one Disdainful Stroke two Stubborn Denial one Ceremonious Rejection two Collective Brutality one Fatal Push one Dispel one Drown in the Lock one Ashiok Dream Render two Extirpate and a Damnation so Extirpate's an interesting one. Uh, you can definitely strip the Freed from the Reels uh, if you, or the Fate Stitchers if you find yourself in a good enough situation to do so, but all things considered, I'm not a huge fan of it. The Force of Negations seem great to me. 
Uh, you prevent your opponent from really trying to combo off on their turn. You can counter things like Utopia Sprawl early. You can counter things like Nissa if they matter. So most of Dylan's threats are uh, hittable by Force of Negation. So I think I'm into that one. Um, the extra Stubborn Denials, I expect those to come in too. Uh, pretty odd seeing two Stubborn Denial in the sideboard here from Abraham, but it's been a while since we've really seen Grixis Death Shadow uh, at the front of the meta, so I guess uh, Abraham's probably been doing more research than I have on what's correct nowadays, and uh, uh, it seems reasonable to me. Uh, there isn't that much creature interaction floating around right now. It's mostly just people turning things into elk, so <laughs> I suppose it's pretty hard to counter Oko with Stubborn Denial sometimes, so that makes enough sense to me. Uh, let's see, meanwhile, on Dylan's side, we have two Veil of Summer, two Tireless Tracker, two Dispel, one Lightning Bolt, one Flame Slash, one Magnetic Sinkhole, two Mystical Dispute, two Graph Digger's Cage, and two Inferno Titan. So, this is definitely interesting. Inferno Titan feels like this might be the matchup for it. It costs a lot of mana, but if you get there, it definitely is a card that GDS is probably not going to be able to beat, so I could get behind that. Flame Slash is kind of awkward. Magmatic Sinkhole at least deals 5 damage, so I think I buy that one. That one's probably good enough for me. Veil of Summers or Slam Dunks. Tireless Tracker is another interesting one. I guess we're probably trying to grind in this matchup because we can't really expect to combo our opponent in a post-board game, so I suppose those will probably come in. Uh, Dispel, if we want to try and fight or combo through, is another interesting choice. Same with the Mystical Disputes. So, that's a kind of interesting sideboard decision. We can go Veil of Summer, Tireless Tracker, Inferno Titan, if we're feeling like we want to go bigger and kind of abandon our combo a little bit. We could also go uh, Mystical Dispute, Dispels, and try and force our combo through. So, I, I don't think we probably have enough room for all of these things. So we probably have to pick a plan and try and go with it. And I could even see that change on play draw. I could see Inferno Titans and the lot coming in on the draw versus the Mystical Disputes and the lot coming in on the play. So we'll have to see what Dylan decides to do. Uh, apparently, GDS the most represented deck at the last European GP. That That is pretty surprising. I did not know that. Uh, I wonder... I wonder what caused that. I mean, I, I know that uh, Grixis Death Shadow is definitely, like, a fan favorite. Uh, everybody really likes the deck. It's super fun to play. It feel, feels kind of like a legacy deck, to be honest. So, uh, it's not super surprising that people decided to play it. But, at the same time, I am a little, a little surprised that now is the time that everybody's playing it. I don't know. I, I would expect a lot of uh, artifact combo decks and that type of thing. Apparently it has a reasonable words on matchup. I buy that for sure. Um, I definitely don't want to get my like, my like Death Shadows turned into Elk. But, you know. That, that makes sense to me. Reasonable words on matchup. Fun deck to play. Yeah, I, I could easily see it being the most represented deck at a, at a given tournament. Um, I'm not certain what results it put up at the tournament. I uh, d definitely missed the results for that particular GP. Or at least wasn't quite paying attention to those statistics, but uh, regardless, I'm still surprised about the Stubborn Denial on the sideboard. Um, so, looks like our players have finished up with their sideboarding, so let's go ahead and see how game number two plays out. Of course, we'll see Abraham on the play this game. I was uh, pretty happy with Abraham's position there. I think he was in general winning, but of course, you know, one of the powers of these combo decks is sometimes you just draw the perfect card and kill your opponent, and that's definitely what we saw there. And granted, Dylan had a lot of outs to be able to do that. Uh, he needed any land to play Nyssa, and that would have been able to... Uh, I don't believe that would have been able to kill that turn, because he didn't have quite enough mana, but it certainly would have been able to next turn. And then he also, you know, Fertile Ground or Utopia Sprawl allowed him to do what we saw, so... Pretty powerful stuff over on Dylan's side of the field. Uh, he's going to take a quick mulligan here. We'll see. Make sure Abraham wants to keep his. Looks like he does. So we're going to see 
a 7 versus a 6. Obviously, mulliganing against these Thoughtseize decks, pretty rough, especially for these combo decks that are looking for pieces. Oh, but it looks like Abraham's just going to ship it back to you. So, a little bit of out-of-sequence mulliganing, but Dylan uh, not going to wait for Abraham to make his decision. <laughs> just going to go ahead and ship back his unplayable hand. So, definitely a reasonable take there. <laughs> All right, let's see if Dylan can find a more reasonable six-card hand for his second match. Uh, looks like he's going to go ahead and wait. This time, however, he's going to go ahead and wait for Abraham. I missed the point of shipping back your hand early, your, your first hand before your opponent's decided, and then waiting to look at your second hand before your opponent draws their hand. There's definite dichotomy here. I don't agree with. I, I think if you're if you're going for speedy play, you know, let's not waste everybody's time. I'm you know, this hand's unkeepable, whatever, great. Yeah, I, I don't care about the points, sure, whatever. But then if you're gonna wait until your opponent's done shuffling to look at your hand, I, I I'm off that to be honest. <laughs> I, I I don't agree with that line, Dylan. I think you found the worst line here. So both players taking a look at their sixes. Abraham's looks a little, a little meh, to be honest. But uh, looks like he will keep it. Dylan, on the other hand, we'll see if he wants to keep his. Gonna have to slap a card on the bottom. Looks like Merchant of the Veil going away. He's got a second copy of those. Merchant of the Veil, definitely a strange inclusion in this uh teamer freed from the real combo deck so uh we'll have to see uh if that uh ends up paying off for him it wasn't uh it wasn't the best so it looks like uh dylan running to the bathroom real quick so uh, i've been told that i have to stall which is no problem how's it going everybody out in twitch chat uh we had a pretty pretty exciting first match if you guys uh <laughs> missed any of that first match i recommend you go ahead and check out the paradise games youtube channel where you can see the pod vods uh in all of their glory make sure you didn't miss any of the action and if you're watching on youtube please be sure to come back and check out us live we stream every monday and friday at 6 30 p.m we will be missing this friday due to the holidays but after that we're going to make it up for you guys with uh starting thursday pioneer tournaments so uh we'll be streaming those so it'll s jump to monday thursday and friday gonna be lots of pod vods going out so uh I hope to see you guys there. Regardless, let's take a look at this. We've got Thought Seize coming out. So, let's see what Dylan is going to be losing. We've got Muddle the Mixture, Nissa. Uh, I'm not sure what else is going on here. Looks like Utopia Sprawl going to be the take. Uh, yeah, so we've got Utopia Sprawl, Forest Stomping Ground, Nissa, Muddle the Mixture, and Merchant of the Veil, I believe, are the cards in hand here. Muddle the Mixture, definitely an odd include here from uh, this teamer this teamer deck. Of course, Dylan missing blue mana, so we're quite a ways off the transmute. Looks like we're going turn one, shock in a stomping ground. That'll put him down to 18. It looks like he's going to be nice and just play with the cards up for us. Of course... I expect us to see a cycling of this Merchant of the Veil at the end of the turn here. But, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think Abyssal Mole, that uh, all these wonky modern combo decks are definitely a hallmark of the format. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you've got, you get to play your sweet combo deck, nobody's punishing you for it, they're all just playing their Okos or whatever, and then they're like, alright, and Disruption, Giant Creature, Counter Spells, yeah. That, that seems like airy. This is why we see Delver decks in Legacy, and also GDS to a definite certain extent, have powerful combo matchups. I mean, look at this, we just see Thought Seize into a 5-5 five -five on turn 2. That is going to be hard for any combo deck to beat. Super fast clock, so interesting 10 copies of gds in day two of columbus that's pretty interesting columbus uh i'm definitely looking forward to seeing the top eight of that of that event uh not uh excuse me not columbus the upcoming uh gp austin so uh i'm looking forward to seeing the numbers for that uh, i've been mostly out of the loop for modern and, and i mean 
out of the loop is definitely uh, probably an o- over aggressive statement. I I play a lot of Magic and I'm always to an extent in the loop, but my focuses have definitely been on Standard and Pioneer uh, lately, trying to you know play my PTQs, get these uh, players tour invites, trying to be part of the first ever players tour. Pretty important, but uh, and of course Pioneer then is the new hotness. You can't not play it. So Modern's kind of been on a back burner for me, but. Definitely still keeping up with it, playing uh, pretty frequently, and of course, you know, streaming every Monday, so definitely not slouching on my modern playing, so. Looks like we're going to see end of turn fetch here from Dylan. This game's progressed uh, pretty much as we would expect. Uh, Dylan cast his, you know, three mana, two, three Merchant of the Veil, vale, just went ahead and blocked with it to buy him a ton to buy him some time basically just cast and explore there to be honest uh which is pretty fine for dylan here comes the nissa i assume we'll see something here from abraham indeed we will and here's end of turn snapcaster mage for lethal and yeah just how we drew it up that's pretty easy uh that looks a lot more like how i expected game one to go there that jerk <laughs> what a jerk has a has a good six card hand in game number two ah yeah that 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 hand looked quite powerful from abraham i mean i talked about how every combo deck is gonna struggle to beat that and I, i'm gonna stand by that one like thoughtsies here's a five five here's a piece of interaction plus a you know a snapcaster mage for lethal yuck that's disgusting that's so so good so uh, just a quick turn five kill there from Abraham leaves uh, Dylan kind of on the back foot there. Of course, turn five kill, not the fastest that Modern has to offer, but it feels pretty blazing when they also have a thought seize and a counter spell. So pretty rough for Dylan. We'll see if he can find a better plan for this next game. Looks like he didn't go back and touch a sideboard, so I mentioned potentially swapping between your uh, kind of mid range your plan and your protect my combo plan on play draw, but looks like he's just going to go ahead and leave it the way it is. Of course, uh, I think Veil of Summer, definitely an inclusion in both of those. Veil of Summer, hugely important card in matchups like this. I expect that that card on its own probably made this matchup sig- like probably like 5% five, 5 better for these like wacky green based combo decks. I mean, it counters the thought sees, it counters the counter spells that are interrupting or that are interrupt that are interacting with you, excuse me, and interrupting you for what it's worth. So, it's definitely a very important card. Dylan goes ahead and gets his Utopia Sprawl out under all of these thought seizes. I assume it is naming blue. Uh, it is in fact naming blue. Got that one from the floor. Here is polluted delta from Abraham. He's probably deciding what he wants to do on his first turn of the game. Thought sees definitely an option. Uh, we'll see if he wants to ship the turn back potentially with a stubborn denial up that type of thing. Maybe he's just got a whole lot of nothing currently. So we'll have to see how this goes. Looks like he's in the tank for now. I see. I'm not getting a great look at these cards in hand here. I see an island. That's the one that jumps out to me. I think I also saw a steam vents. Oh, there's an extirpate there. So it looks like he did decide to bring in the extirpates, but it looks like he's going to lean thought seize now. So must have been deciding between potential extirpating and the thought seize. Looks like thought seize is going to take free from the reel. That's a very powerful hand, a very scary hand from Dylan there. Uh, he's missing a kill condition, but uh, if he had let Dylan untap, uh, if he had just, you know, let Dylan have his fate stitcher and then untap with it, of course, Dylan would have been able to make infinite mana. So he was a couple turns away from dying. That would have been a nice turn three kill, assuming Dylan found a, a way to use his infinite mana. But of course, nothing yet. Here's land for a turn. It's wooded foothills. He'll ship the turn back. Dryad Arbor sitting in Dylan's hand. Probably not where he wants it. He probably wishes he could go fetch it out here at some point. Of course, Dryad Arbor. Uh, just a nice inclusion into these green-based decks. It has a lot of utility between you know blocking, saving you some damage, and also being uh, you know potential sacrifice fodder for Liliana of the Veil, that type of deal. So... All right, let's see what's going on now. Extirpate looking pretty juicy right now. 
if Abraham elects to go ahead and do that. Of course, it would be powerful, but it looks like he's going to ship the turn back for now. We'll see how this decides to play out. Of course, he did take two damage. Doesn't necessarily mean anything out of Grixis Shadow. Two damage, definitely pretty important. Here's the draw step extirpate. You're freed from the reels. That is a uh, pretty common play. Of course, uh, correct timing here with the split second on extirpate. You're not going to be worried about getting countered or anything. You can just go ahead and do that freely. So, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with extirpate, it's essentially surgical extraction. Uh, it has split second, and you have to pay black mana for it. So. But uh, other than that, it's effectively surgical extraction. So uh, it looks like Dylan still with all four copies of Freed from the Real in his deck. Uh, I didn't. I should have looked through Dylan's deck there while Abraham was to get an idea for how he sideboarded. But uh, I did not quite see. I did not exactly see what it was. So there's that draw step, and now Dylan's gonna go ahead and play his Misty Rainforest. So of course he's just gonna be able to uh he's just gonna be able to cast his fate stitcher this turn not too exciting i think he tapped one too many mana for that as he does have the utopia sprawl currently but uh whatever oh no i'm sorry i'm sorry everything here is fine my my bad miss saw the number of lands there so notably dylan has a nissa and an inferno titan so next turn he's going to be able to cast nissa and then turn after that he's going to be able to cast inferno titan so uh that's definitely a problem for abraham he's managed to deal with all the fate state or all of the freed from the reels but yeah there there goes the fate stitcher get rid of the guaranteed nissa on this turn but now dylan is uh one land away from being able to uh do this Oh, looks like we still have Nyssa. Of course, the Unearth from the Fate Stitcher allows him to be able to cast it. So now we're going to see Nyssa plus, and now Dylan feels like he's firmly in the driver's seat. This is what Nyssa's here to do. And of course, if Abraham has like a copy of Death Shadow here or something, we could see that turn around. But Inferno Titan next turn looks to be a pretty big problem, though I don't know that Dylan has the red mana required to be able to do it. Um... So we'll have to see, and now he just doesn't have the mana required, so he's going to need a land to be able to do that. Dryad Arbor and Forest both getting Fatal Pushed. However, Windswept Heath, that's just what the Doctor ordered. He needs to find red mana, though, to be able to cast his Inferno Titan. So hopefully we'll see him fetch correctly. He will, in fact, and this looks like just enough mana for an Inferno Titan, and then you can, you know, Fire Breathe it too one time while you're at it, but <laughs> whatever. So here's Inferno Titan. I expect that we're sending three damage upstairs. This will put Abraham down to five, I believe. Uh, and here is a plus on Stomping Ground. Attack Abraham down to two. So now we're in category, uh, if we get to attack with Inferno Titan, uh, we have lethal. So <laughs> all Dylan needs to do is untap. And I don't know that there's very many answers to Inferno Titan in Dylan's deck. Uh, I think there's like, or in Abraham's deck, excuse me. I can't even think of any off the top of my head, so I'm not really sure what Abraham's looking for here to be able to get back in this. And yeah, now we see this this Inferno Titan really did its job here. Uh, of course, coupled with Nissa being able to gun down Abraham's life total very quickly. Here's a Teamer Battle Rage and a Test Shadow, but that is not quite good enough because as soon as Dylan goes to attacks, he will have lethal. Not to mention the fact that Abraham just doesn't have enough blockers anyway. <laughs> Magmatic Sinkhole off the top. That is not good enough. Merchant of the Veil. Going to go ahead and exile his... Or discard his Magmatic Sinkhole. Take a redraw. Um, looks like nothing too much going on here on Dylan's side of the battlefield. But I think that Abraham's just dead. And all he needs to do is attack anyway. I think Abraham just making him do it currently. We'll see what he's got. Teamer Battle Rage, your Inferno Titan. <laughs> Muddle the mixture to counter it anyways. <laughs> but uh, with that, we will see Dylan take the match over Grixis Death Shadow. So it looked to be a tough matchup for Dylan, but 
we saw him take it down anyway. So pretty impressive stuff from him overall. Uh, you know, we saw what Abraham's trying to do in that second game there where he just blew him away with the uh, with the thought sees and the Gurmag Angler nonsense. But uh, we definitely saw both plans of Dylan's deck pay out there. The pl post board plan with just the combo coming together and then uh or the pre-board plan with the combo coming together and then the post-board plan with the inferno titans and the nissa really getting in there and yeah the nissa's in the main deck but still definitely helps the uh main board plan so it looks like he went with two inferno titan magmatics and cold double veil of summer seems pretty reasonable to me i, I think i tend to agree with a, roughly that board plan uh, with that done, I'm going to take uh, a moment to talk about Paradise Games. Uh, I mentioned it briefly earlier, Paradise Games, we are in Bellingham, Washington. So if you are in the area, please be sure to come and check us out. We have uh, events firing pretty much daily here for Magic the Gathering and other card games, if you're into those. Star Wars Destiny, I believe, is going on outside as we speak. Uh, we stream uh, every week, Mondays and Fridays at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, with the exception that we will not be live this coming Friday due to the holidays. Uh, that being said, uh, if you are watching us live, thank you so much. But if you missed anything, go ahead and check out our YouTube page. You can go find the PodVod on our YouTube channel. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to come check us out live at twitch.tv slash paradise games. Uh, if you are not already uh, following the channel, please be sure to do that. And if everybody is using their, uh, if everybody out there is not using their Twitch Prime subscription, you get it for free. If you have Amazon Prime, all you have to do is link your account, and then you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It helps us out a bunch, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. So, uh, if you guys are not using that Twitch Prime subscription, uh, please, please link your account and uh, go ahead and send that our way. Uh, it helps us, helps me particularly, be here to bring this content to you guys. Um, with that, we also have a Pioneer 1K coming up on December 14th. It pays out in cash. So if you're in the Bellingham area, please be sure to sign up for it or the Seattle area, or greater Seattle area, regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can sign up uh, prior to the event on our website just by going to that Magic Events tab that you can see right there. Uh, and I highly recommend you do so because uh, I expect that it will cap. We have a 48 player cap here, so please be sure to pre-register. If you do not do that, uh, you might end up without a spot and you definitely don't want to miss this. Uh, if you can't make it for whatever reason, uh, we will be streaming the event. So I'll be here on that December 14th bringing you guys the entire tournament. So don't be afraid. Uh, I will be able to have it streamed for you guys. So with that, I'm going to leave you all with some capacity. I'll see if I can find another match for us real quick. Um, but regardless, I won't be gone for long, so make sure you guys don't go anywhere.
of the barrel I like to sleep in hidey holes and bar room 
stalls I like to hear the piano playing in the bloody little dawn I like to wake up with the devil and drink him till he's gone The queen is drunk and someone armed the poor Welcome back for the third and final round of the night. We've got, oh gosh, uh, Simic Eldrazi, labeled Hope Control for some terrible reason, <laughs> um, versus Grixis Death's Shadow. So, uh, both of our player, both of these players are two and O currently. So we saw a little bit of Grixis Death's Shadow from Abraham last round. Now we'll see Pete try and. Uh, do a little bit better than Abraham managed to do in his last round. Nether Knight, thank you very, very much for the Twitch Prime subscription. Uh, much, much appreciated. Thank you so much to Nether Knight. Regardless, uh, let's get back to the match now. We see a uh, pretty good looking hand here from James. Saw a Mattery Shaper, a few lands. Uh, looked like it was lacking. Uh, too many big payoffs. I think I saw a Drowner of Hope in there, but uh, notably, Oko got stripped from his hand with that Inquisition of Kozilek. Over on Pete's side, we got some Mistress Bobbles hanging out with his Inquisition of Kozilek, so nothing too bad. Here's Yavamaya Coast into a Boreal Druid for James, so I'll put James down to 19. All right. So now we've got a second turn here from Pete. He'll start things off with a Bloodstained Mire. Let's see what he finds off of that. Looks like Steam Vents is the catch. I don't think James is going to be doing anything too, too powerful here. A nice accelerated Matter Reshaper to start things off. But I don't think I see any of the Thought Not Seers or Reality Smashers that really make the deck terrifying. Ancient Strings, however, could potentially find one of them at a later date, but I'd expect to just see a Misty Rainforest followed by a Matter Reshaper here early on. So, there is the Misty Rainforest. Finds a Breeding Pool. He'll take the two. Down to 16 is James. Thankfully, he won't have to take two or take any more damage from his lands, Hopefully for the rest of the game, um, minus, you know, the occasional one from a fetch or whatever. Uh, he should be able to just uh, leave it at that. 
So back over to Pete. Uh, no spells on turn number two, unfortunately for him. Uh, he did fetch to find a better card off of his uh, Mistress Bobble. Here comes Snapcaster Mage targeting Inquisition of Kozilek. We're going to get a look now at James's hand one more time. Looks to be Ancient Stirrings, Matter Reshaper, Drowner of Hope, and I'm missing the last one. Um, didn't quite get a good look at that. Uh, but I believe that the second Matter Reshaper hit the bin. Oh, there's the Thought Knot Seer. So if James has a land, we ought to see it come down. But it looks like he must be missing the land. So uh, here comes Ancient Stirrings. Cavern of Souls looks pretty tempting to me here. Uh, pulled to the front. It's up against Reality Smasher, but when you're missing the lands to cast your spells, you probably gotta take the lands first. So, let's see if that is in fact the choice that James makes. He's got that Reality Smasher. He's thinking about it. It's really greedy to take this Reality Smasher, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I would never do it. But I think that it's gotta be the Cavern of Souls. Just try and get your spells out there. Uh, you know, the Thought Not Seer seems quite quite good i also notably think i would have attacked with my uh matter reshaper before i had cast the ancient turnings because if your opponent blocks and there's a land on top of your deck that you get to put in play with matter reshaper you'll get to go ahead and cast your thought knots here post combat here's oko oko goes directly <laughs> into play oh boy that feels pretty good <laughs> that is pretty absurd actually oko uh definitely showing up here uh, right on time so never mind i think james absolutely should have cast that ancient stirrings first if you're going to end up with an oko in play oko's going to go up to six make a food oko of course uh one of the most oppressive cards from throne of eldraine if not the most oppressive card from throne of eldraine i'm sure everybody is uh sick of it at this point here's another ancient stirrings from james let's see what he finds looks like it is going to be eldrazi temple and that will allow him to cast that uh, nice matter or that nice reality smasher in his hand for next turn. So next turn, we could see something along the lines of land for turn, reality smasher, make my food into an elk, and attack for like nine or something absurd if that boreal druid gets in there, if we find a land. Uh, here is uh, Inquisition of Kozilek, show you Drowner of Hope, uh, reality smasher, and Thought Knots here. I believe the term is despair, Pete. I believe the term is despair. <laughs> Drowner of Hope's going to get a read from Pete. That's pretty reasonable. <laughs> I think that uh, that one probably deserves to be read if you uh, don't remember that one. All right. Let's see what James wants to do now. He's got plenty of options. I'd be surprised to see anything that isn't... Uh, Cast my Reality Smasher and make my food and elk. It looks like James starts with make my food and elk. Here is that Reality Smasher. Uh, go to combat, attack for eight. Uh, Dismember is going to get pointed at the Reality Smasher. He'll discard a forest to it. Looks like he's going to have to take two damage to be able to make that happen. But then the Reality Smasher will go away. So Pete taking a total of five down to eight here. And well, James finds a nice two for one out of his five five trample haster. So I guess you can't be too upset about that. <laughs> And with that, we ought to see it go back to Pete. Pete, notably lacking any threats here, he kept a uh, hand with quite a few Inquisition of Kozilex, a few ways to sculpt his hand, but not any powerful ways to kind of get ahead. And that is often a problem with these decks. And there is Elder Deep Fiend off the top. The hits don't stop coming for James. Here is Thought Not Seer. Fatal Push will take out the food token on Pete's side of the battlefield, and then uh, we might just see the Snapcaster Mage get flashed in here. I'm not certain what his other card is. It would, of course, give him at least a 2-1 uh, down the road if his other card is a blank. So it looks like that is what we'll see, and it is Stubborn Denial, pretty much a blank. So I think I agree with that choice from Pete. Uh, and now we'll see if James wants to get aggressive with this Boreal Druid. Looks like just a food for now is the choice. I think... I tend to agree. We need the mana pretty badly, actually, so I think I like this choice. Send it on over to Pete. He's got no cards in hand. Watery Grave off the top means that we are pretty much done here. He knows the bad news that's coming, and we will see uh, James take down the first game here. Let's take a look at what Pete can do to uh, kind of put a band-aid over this matchup. He's got one Plague Engineer, two Coligan's Command, 
one Drown in the Lock, one the Royal Scions, two Damping Sphere, one Disdainful Stroke, one Engineered Explosives, one Surgical Extraction, two Mystical Dispute, and three Collective Brutality. So, I think that, uh, out of Pete's sideboard, hello, B-Man Hero, how are you doing tonight? Uh, so, anyways, out of Pete's sideboard, I think that the Plague Engineer is obviously really good. Uh, you get to name Eldrazi, and it trades, and that's kind of as much as you can hope for. This is not Pioneer, this is Modern. Uh, although, uh, we definitely see the Simic Eldrazi deck, uh, somewhat appear in Pioneer as well. Um, but definitely gets some pretty notable upgrades with, like, Eldrazi Temple and Modern. Um, anyways, uh, the Disdainful Stroke is pretty good if you manage to find a game where the Eldrazi player doesn't have Cavern of Souls, which... I think you probably can assume will happen a reasonable amount of the time. Engineered Explosive's interesting. It can deal with Oko. It can kill some of the... Uh, it can kill some of the cheap Eldrazi. And it can kill a lot of the mana dorks. Um, so that's potentially interesting if you play turn 1, Engineered Explosive's for 1. Turn 2, just crack it and destroy a mana dork. I could buy that on the play. But other than that, nothing too crazy. Drown in the Lock, another one that seems probably pretty good here. Um, hopefully is able to kill, uh, some of the, uh, hopefully the Drown on the Lock is able to kill some of the bigger Eldrazi. Uh, sort of new to Magic, what set is Modern? Modern is 8th edition onwards, so it's similar to Pioneer in that, uh, the, f uh, the format doesn't rotate. Uh, every set that comes out, um, from here on out will be Modern Legal. It just goes back further, so, whereas Pioneer starts from Return to Ravnica onward, uh, Modern goes back another about seven or so years down to 8th edition, so uh, in general you see more powerful decks, um, definitely more variety in the decks, and also the format's much older, so there's a much more established meta compared to Pioneer, but uh, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions you have, so uh, if you don't know what any of the cards are or what any of the plans are, feel free to ask, B-Man Hero. I would uh, love to help you out. Let's uh, take a look at James's sideboard, though. We have two Damping Sphere, two Weather the Storm, two Graft Digger's Cage, two Engineered Explosives, two Stubborn Denial, and two Disdainful Strokes. Or, excuse me, three Stubborn Denial and two Disdainful Stroke. Nice clean sideboard here. Uh, Engineered Explosives is excellent against Grixis Dust Shadow. Uh, the Graft Digger's Cages, we can leave those at home. Uh, the Stubborn Denial seem pretty good to me. Uh, you get to try and fight that counter war that I assume that GDS is going to be fighting you with. Uh, and notably, even if they aren't fighting you on that axis, they, uh, they're they going to be casting a lot of spells. So, uh, Stubborn Denial seems good, assuming you have the creatures to support it. And, you know, even the Force Spike mode on Stubborn Denial going to be pretty good. Hoping to make a mill deck. Well, that sounds exciting. Hopefully that goes out well for you. The mill deck's... Uh, Actually got a little more <laughs> James showing off for the camera there. Uh, the mill decks got reasonably more powerful lately. They they used to be um, sort of underpowered, and uh, you know even even now uh, I don't think you're going to find a tier one mill deck. But I actually think we're relatively close to having that for what it's worth. Um, so uh, hopefully you can find the uh, the that perfect mill deck that really that really gets there and with new sets coming out drown in the lock you know and staring bridge is another hit uh in the mill decks that type of thing and you know you've always got the absurd archive trap nut draws so mills definitely a deck that can win a tournament um there's definitely some pretty bad matchups you have to have a good plan for combo when you're showing up with mill make sure you packed enough counter magic in your 75 to be able to deal with that and you're not just you know hell bent on making sure you mill your opponent out. In general, it's better to uh, take a turn off or two, I think, and then you can you know, use those extra turns to end up killing your opponent anyway, but making sure you're interacting uh, along the way is a pretty important plan for that, I think. But uh, uh, not new to Magic, just haven't played in a while. When did you uh, When did you stop playing? What, uh, what set did you, you stop playing in? Okay, so it looks like Pete on a mole to six here, while James keeps his seven. Oh, karate chops not allowed in the shop. Update. Uh, you can prevent mill decks if you have an Ember Cold Eon stored in your deck. That's true. There's not too many of those floating around in modern, but uh, it's definitely one of those things you have to worry about. There's, there's some cards that just have that text, and it's pretty rough. So let's get a good look at James's opening card, opening 
hand here. Uh, we have Once Upon a Time Breeding Pool, Thought Dots here, Reality Smasher, uh, Cavern of Souls, Yavamai Coast, and Prismatic... Vi oh, excuse me, Misty Rainforest, uh, Yavamai Coast, and Prismatic Vista. So, uh, we'll see if Pete wants to take the Once Upon a Time that's probably looking to speed James's hand up, and then... You know, Pete's going to look to have a lot of time to be able to deal, to be able to develop the board uninterrupted, most likely, uh, if he takes that once upon a time. Or he could try and take the more powerful spells in Thought Not Seer, Reality Smasher. Um, Thought Not Seer's particularly good, so. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's been a little while, probably about, yeah. Been a, been a little while for you, about six, seven years. So you probably stopped playing right around when Theros, uh, Return to Ravnica and all that came out, something along those lines. So, uh, Pioneer's probably all new stuff to you. So, uh, uh, you hopefully will recognize some of these cards um, from uh, back back then. Uh, notably, uh, the Seldrazi decks full of newer cards. So those ones might be a, a little a little different. But Mistress Bobble Thoughtsies hopefully ring some bells. Uh, Mistress Bobble going to target Jeems. He'll get a sneak peek. Interesting that he targeted Jeems instead of himself there, Pete. He did have the fetch land, uh, so he could have potentially had some better card selection. So, definitely an odd choice. All right. Got Blood Crypt coming off the top here from that Polluted Delta. Pestilent Spirit. Ooh, that, that card is sweet. Big fan of Pestilent Spirit. I, uh... Crushed many a many a draft with that one. Uh, have yet to play it in constructed, but I do thoroughly enjoy the card. All right, we've got Thought Scour. That's gonna mill a stubborn denial and another Thought Scour. It'll draw him one card. Here's a Gurmag Angler from Pete, and now Pete's down to twelve already. But he is presenting a pretty fast clock here, and with James's, uh, I'm gonna go with Glacial hand it's very very slow Ooh, noble hierarch though looking to speed it up with james's pretty slow hand it looks like that might be able to kind of pull away that being said noble hierarch is uh going to be uh very very good at getting james onto the board the next turn so now he's going to be able to cast that thought not seer that's in his hand uh on the next turn and it's not big enough to brawl with gurmag angler immediately but it is going to kind of clear the way for this Reality Smasher, and that's a pretty big deal. Oh, sick. I am. I hope that you crush that tournament, B-Man. All right. So we've got Forest off the top for James. So let's see what he wants to do. I'd be surprised if we didn't see... Uh, oh, it looks like Pete meant to play a death shadow on his turn so uh here is the thought not seer team of battle rage and gurmag angler the cards in hand for pete interesting choice here the team of battle rage definitely allows him to kind of trade favorably in combat uh but i'm not certain which one is really better you know the the gurmag angler is going to be doing a whole lot of nothing for a long time but it is going to be better likely in the long run so here's Bloodstained Mire, that's a pretty good draw. So, I would expect to see... We have a 1-1 Death Shadow currently, so you can go ahead and block the Death Shadow and trade, and then uh, the Thought Not Seer... Of course, Pete will get to draw a card when the Thought Not Seer dies, but you probably have to do that, and uh, looks like James agrees. We're going to try and trade with the uh, Gurmeg Angler, presumably, with our Reality Smasher next turn as well. So... Uh, it's going to be rough to deal with this Death Shadow if it gets too much bigger. So I like this choice from James. Um, can we get a deck check on how many Matsu signatures James has got there? I believe there are three Matsu signatures down there. So that's uh, that's the good one. Dreadhorde Arcanist in the Pestilence Spirit deck. That sounds good to me. I buy that. Get some extra spells. Cast some more Lightning Bolts. I'm, I'm about that. All right. Let's see what James wants to do now. I, like I said, I'd be kind of surprised to see anything other than Reality Smasher going on here. Um, 
It's a 5-5. Five, five. I think the plan is probably just trade with Gurmag Angler. I mean, you could definitely just attack for 6, and that puts Pete in kind of an awkward situation, but if he draws a Death Shadow, then we're in a real bind. Granted, I think that if Pete had the Death Shadow, he absolutely would have deployed it there, so it's probably only just the top card at a Death Shadow, but, you know, he would know. It looks like James is going to go for the attack, so opting into the race, put Pete down to 3. Uh, James is straight blue-green, just blue-green Eldrazi, uh, you get Boreal Druid, uh, Oko, you don't really need the White Splash, the only thing you'd probably get is like a Teferi Eldrazi, uh, um, oh, the Bounce one, I, that I can't remember the name of, uh, somebody will have to remind me the, uh, the name of the three-mana Flicker Eldrazi, Eldrazi Displacer, that's it, um, so not electing to ruin his mana too much for that, I think that that's a good choice, you're basically a four-color deck, uh, at that point, because colorless is a very important mana symbol, so I think that you definitely need to uh, need to keep yourself the nice, you know, balanced color pair here. So here's another Gurmag Angler from Pete. Here's the attack that'll put James down all the way to ten. Of course, this not a lethal attack from James. Oh, James is at four. Oh, that's very different. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Eldrazi Time Raveler. Not quite, not quite. Okay. So let's see what James wants to do now. Looks like he's leading things off with Once Upon a Time. That Mattery Shaper pulled to the front. That one looks pretty good to me. Um, notably, if we attack here, Pete is going to have to block, and he'll still take one down to one. So that's pretty good. If, you know, James had managed to found... If James had managed to find, excuse me... A noble hierarch there he would have been able to attack for lethal but no good of course if uh, James was able to take that Oko there as well he also would have been able to uh, attack for lethal by making uh, that uh, Gurmag angler into a 3-3 elk and then just trampling right over it with its reality smasher So now James playing his Misty Rainforest. I would expect that we will see uh, a post-combat crack my Misty Rainforest and then just deploy the Mattery Shaper in hand. It means that Pete will have to have two pieces of interaction to be able to get through. And he only has one card in hand. So probably pretty likely that James is going to be good here and then he'll untap and have a lethal attack. But uh, regardless... Let's see if Pete can find what he needs off the top. Team or Battle Rage, most likely going to need to be the card. I uh, can't quite see what the cards in his hand are, so Pete making a sweat. Here's an attack. Block with Matter Reshaper. Pretty easy there from James. Looks like damage will happen. So James going to be surviving this combat step. Ancient Stirrings goes to hand. And then Polluted Delta into the bin will mean that James will take down uh, Pete in our third and final round of the night. Um, so with that, that is going to be the end of tonight's stream. I want to thank everybody out there for joining me tonight. Uh, had a lot of great uh, chat interaction throughout the whole night, so it made uh, the solo casting uh, much more bearable, so much appreciated. Can we get a post-game interview with James? Uh, I'll, I'll have the floor go ahead and ask him if he wants to jump in, but... Um, while we wait for a potential post-game interview with James, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for the stream, uh, Die Hard Dice. Die Hard is the best dice in the business for mostly tabletop RPGs, but also war games if you're into those. Uh, they have the best dice if you need if you use dice for magic too. Uh, they're the best ones. They're metal. They're hard. They look really nice, and everybody likes having cool you're equipment. You're not requested for a post-game interview. <laughs> you are. Let me finish the sponsor real quick, and then we'll talk to you, James. Um, <laughs> 
But Die Hard Dice has the best dice. They're metal, they're hard, they're super cool, they feel great to roll, they look great, and if you are looking for a gift for somebody coming up, uh, potentially for the holiday season, highly recommend Die Hard Dice. We have them in store, and due to our rainy day special, uh, that means that uh, they're even 20% off right now. So go ahead, check out Die Hard Dice, and thank you to Die Hard Dice for sponsoring the stream. Hi, James, how's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, doing all right. You just three owed tonight's mod. Modern uh, Magic at Paradise Games. What are you? What are you doing now? I don't know. Probably going home. Going to Disneyland. <laughs> going oh. to Disneyland. You're going to Disneyland. Uh, thank you, Jassassin, for the nice Yabamaya coast. I have a nice Jap Japanese <laughs> apocalypse Yabamaya coast. I take it you got it from him. I may have got it from Jassassin <laughs> Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, so you just crushed some people with Simic Eldrazi. Uh, yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about that deck? All right. So the deck's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Elder Teeth Fiend looked nice. You didn't play it, I didn't but it play looked it. sick. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's great. Uh, that's how I won a game against uh, Blue Moon. Uh, didn't and didn't really cast it that much, but I play three of them and they're great. Uh, that's too bad. You should cast it more. Oko Thief of Crowns is not reasonable. It's not an okay magic card. <laughs> and I can get it off of uh, get it off of Mattery Shaper as it turns out. First time I've done that, but it's nuts. Yeah, it seems really. It's really <laughs> I saw you flip that. I was like, oh no. <laughs> no, Oko. Oko. <laughs> okay. Um, but Oko shuts down just like all of Grixis Death Shadow's creatures. Oh yeah, uh, that card is absurd. Gurmag being a five five converted to a three three is nice. Uh, Death Shadow, you hurt yourself enough, and then you just get a three three for it. You yeah. know, it's great. Yeah. So, uh, um, with that, it's pretty pretty sick that deck looks fun i'm i'm gonna have to play a little bit with that deck i'm it's about oko fun. i'm about oko and i'm mostly about elder deep fiend that yeah. card's yeah the nuts get to play drowner hope too but i'm more convinced uh that we can uh put and bring her instead of that because i think drawing cards is just a better revenue than tapping creatures drowner? i don't make enough scions to like utilize that I drowner of hope is uh pretty medium probably yeah but it is really sweet yeah agreed okay so uh, I think uh, I'll answer a couple more questions from chat here. Might as well hang out. Uh, B-Man here, uh, you can check on Gatherer is probably the best thing. Uh, or if you use any of the online clients, uh, thinking card websites like tappedout.net, uh, they'll tell you if your cards are modern legal when you go ahead and put your deck online. Or if you search up the card on Gatherer, which is Magic Gathering's official like card searching database, uh, they'll tell you if the cards are legal. Um, also, ever emerge Elder to... Deep Fiend off your Rekindling Phoenix, champs? No, I have not played that deck in Pioneer. That's although, unfortunate. Although it seems like it seems fine. sick. <laughs> yeah, like I was interested in that deck, but then why do that when I can play Oko and Reality Smash and Heart of Kirin in the same deck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair so point. I'm You're building... playing Heart of Kirin. Yeah, because you what? plus you plus two Oko, <laughs> oh, you get a food, and then you heck? minus one, and you four oh, four vigilance. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and it flies. It's real good. That's so sick. <laughs> yeah. I didn't and know you, you were playing Heart of Kirin. Why are you playing? Oh wait, I, are you talking about my deck? No, I'm talking about Pioneer. Oh Pioneer. Okay, yeah. I thought you were. I thought you were just like playing Heart of Kirin in Modern. I was oh. like, oh my god. No, what? I would never dream of it. Yeah, that, that um, seems also, ludicrous to me. Nice elk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tap one. Yeah, tappedout.net. Thank you, Assassin. Thank for you for the hookup. Sorry, we're talking about cool things. Yeah, we're kind of kind of just. Hanging out. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Also, I didn't know if my last play was fine, but I figured if you had a Fatal Push to remove my Noble Hierarch, I, I, think needed, a, play I needed a backup yeah, to, I like, block this Gurmag Angler. Yeah, I mean, Gurmag, or Grixis Death Shadow doesn't play very many Lightning Bolts. Or, uh, or when I played it, bolts. it played, like, one in the main yeah, and, like, one in the side. Yeah, it's and not I very many. It, I thought it was safe to play around yeah. and, like... Much better to play around the Fatal Pushes or, like, Drown in the Lock or whatever. Worst case scenario, I go to game three on the play with a not-so-glacial um, hand. Yeah, it was, it was very it was, it was very slow. <laughs> yeah, and it gets there. Yeah, it did get there. Well, you ripped the Noble Hierarch like an absolute champion, so... I don't know. It was a turn late. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it was definitely a turn late, but it still cast your spell on time. It did. It did so cast my spell. I think it was actually time. right on time. Yeah. All right. It, it even dodged the thoughtsies, so I think it was actually perfect. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I'm just a professional now. I, I think to say so. About I, that. I think so. Thank All you right. for having me. Yeah. With that, uh, 
Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. If you missed Happy any... Thanksgiving, nerds. <laughs> Later, James. If you missed any of this stream and you want to check it out, go ahead and check out our YouTube channel where uh, we post, post all of our VODs under the title Pod VOD. So just go ahead and search that on YouTube. They should come right up. So uh, if you missed anything, go ahead and check that out. And with that, we will be back in one week's time for Modern again on Monday. We won't be here on Friday for Standard due to the holidays, but normally we will be. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave you with some hot damn scandal. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll see you all next week. Today and the rain came down like a mirror. One big sheet and it shattered on the ground. Now it's seven years of bad luck all over this town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's collection time on all of your debts, and you can't get by just talking. Your smile don't work, and your car don't start, and your doors ain't keeping you alone. No, not even if you like them. No, not even if you like them. When you're tapped into that bit of pain, just about anything. Feels good. Shining on a lost boy's eyes, they reflected oh so pretty. But it's cold behind them golden shores, and the sweet light wasn't nothing more than their own damn wishing. Cause they just don't listen. Now wish on your candles, pray to your God, cry for your mama, put a dollar on the bar. It feels like breathing, but the only good feeling ain't a gimbal is a sin. So I think I'll play it safe and get a gin. I'll take the devil for a spin. When you're tapped into that video. About anything feels good. For some, the morning brings another day, but all it does for me is shine an ugly light around in the room that I've been hiding in. Now I take the harder every day but i ain't here to fix myself i'm just trying to blind these eyes from hell when you're tapped into that